स्टार्ट सर हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू द इंडिया इंटरनेशनल सेंटर्स नेबरहुड फर्स्ट सीरीज इंडियाज नेबरहुड फर्स्ट सीरीज एंड टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस the recent elections in myanmar and its fallout in the region uh elections were held in myanmar under the 2008 military drafted constitution the national league for democracy under aung san suu kyi won a landslide victory bettering her performance of the last elections despite incumbency the elections were held under the covid-19 pandemic conditions the rohingya crisis the buddhist resurgence and the rise of nationalism all in the watch of the military which runs the country in a unique hybrid power sharing system the webinar will address the post election scene in myanmar the civil military relations that obtained there india myanmar relations with big brother china watching and finally the defense and security ties between india and myanmar we have uh, three panelists today and uh, rather four panelists today and they are kin so win who is the director of the tamper deeper institute in wangon in 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 burma or myanmar Uh, the second panelist is gautam mukhopadhyay uh, gautam has been ambassador to myanmar as well as ambassador to afghanistan uh, both are strategic frontiers in the east and the west uh, the third speaker will be myself and i will also be moderating the program and i will be talking about the defense ties between the two countries and we also have uh, dr avinash paliwal he is the director of the south asia institute in the school of oriental and african languages in the united kingdom so we have a power pack panel today and let me start with kinzo win who has a very colorful bio data besides being the director of an institute he has been a prisoner of conscience in myanmar and uh, for seditious writing and also for raising human rights objections uh, so we we'll start with uh, kinzo win and you have uh, 12 minutes for your presentation win the floor is yours okay um thank you general mata no and um hello everybody and welcome um it's my pleasure to be speaking um at ic i've spoken there before so in the interest of time uh general mesa i already told you about the elections um the results are now official there have been some disputes but i don't know how far they will go but domestically and internationally the um uh results have been accepted and um it's another landslide for the national league for democracy led by asan suji yeah. okay now this 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 elections are uh, the third time um the elections have been held under the new constitution and uh following burma's um, myanmar's resumption of the a democratic system they are unique now because they also coincide or less coincide 
with a changeover of the, well, let's say, a pending changeover of the commander-in-chief. Well, he's been in office for 10 years. He has passed retirement age. There's been an extension, but he will have to step down in uh, 2021. So uh, it's doubly interesting, a uh, changeover of the uh, civilian government as well as changeover in the military. As General Mehta has said, we have a unique hybrid system. So um, it's the story is not over yet, I say. Um, next year, too, we will be seeing some interesting developments. I've been requested to uh, talk a little on civil military relations. As you know, we, we've always said it is unique to Burma. Well, this concept, civil military relations, we hear a lot of that um, at the present time. It's almost been turned into an institution. Uh, well, 10, 15 years ago, it wasn't that the case. In Myanmar's case, if you go back a little uh, in history, well, we had very warm relations. Huh? The Myanmar public, Myanmar society had very warm relations with the military because of the independence struggle and independence. Up till 1962, as you know, in that year, General Nye Win mounted a coup and he constructed a separate world for the military. Well, it was in place for half a century around. And because of that, the military assumes that it has a dominant role in Myanmar's political affairs. Now, after such a long time, it is hard to refashion. But that's what Myanmar as a whole is trying to do now, not only the uh, civilian government. And um, it's hard to do, as I said. Now, if you look at civil military relations per se as a whole, you have to look at it in uh, two levels. You know? In Myanmar, the, it's a relationship between two persons at the top, Aung San Suu Kyi in the civilian governments and Senior General May Aung Hai in the, say, five years since the NLD assumed into office in uh, 2015. Now, because of the results of this election, this is going to continue for another term. See, so that means, uh, well, we're going to watch a movie again with the uh, same two actors. You know? And uh, let me say that um, General Milhai will do his best to stay on. Now, in some other posts, not as commander in chief, so we will be seeing the same two faces again. Now, the second level is that this is is at the level of society. And uh, let me tell you, just to repeat what has happened in the last half century, this is um, like two worlds, which is difficult to bridge, especially with the ethnic minorities, because we have a longest running civil war in the world, and it's ethnic now. You know? And um, there's no um, signs of bringing it to an end. It's, it's very sad. Okay, now we go on. This state of affairs, civil and military, carries over into decision making at the national and state level. You know? And um, it's problematic for us. How do you do that when there is so little com communication? No? No. Procedurally and uh, personally you know, and institutionally, it presents big problems. I'll tell you why. Now, according to Myanmar's constitution, the military has 25% of the seats in the uh, Central Union Parliament, but it's only procedural, you know. Um, the representatives don't mix very much. They meet for lunch, you know, but they live in um, separate quarters, and the military officers um, are changed regularly. So there is no real meeting of minds that you will see uh, in an um, ordinary democratic parliament. Now, as a solution, because we have to think of solutions now, when the top doesn't agree and doesn't communicate well with each other, and the body of the parliament doesn't do that, well, just a quick um, proposal, I thought of something. It's like a, 
a cabinet minister who is in charge of civil military liaison. You know, it's, it's just thing that that is um, called for. In Indonesia, you might remember, they have a, a minister in the cabinet who is known as the coordinating minister. Yes, you cannot coordinate all the other ministers. So in Myanmar, it might help because there is some, so much failure of communication. A very apt example of what happens was the crackdown against Rohingyas in Rakhine in 2017. You know? The civilian government handled it badly. And let me tell you, we hear it. The commander in chief um, issued verbal orders to crack down. And you know what happened. You know? Now, lots of people, men, women, and children were killed. Myanmar is facing a case at the International Court of Justice because of that. And 7 lakh, 700,000 refugees are now in Bangladesh. Now, I get interviewed on this again and again. I, I said, you have to cooperate you know, with the international bodies. You have to speak out. It's not just hiding your head in the sand. It's not going to help. Now, this state of affairs, you know, the failure of communication continues until now. So I'll just say a few words on um, the... Um, what this implies for the resumption of peace, you know, achievement of peace at the end of the civil war. As I said, um, it's an ethic war now. We had a communist party in the past, but it uh, crumbled in 1989. So all the wars in Myanmar, they are skirmishes, they are full-scale wars, are ethnic based. So if you don't have a proper ethnic presence in the parliament because of any landslide, energy landslide, and in the reaction to the ethnic armies, you know, uh, there is very little coordination between the civil and the military side. Well, it's just like tragedy after tragedy. Well, the, the army loses a lot too, you know? It's just people, civilian, civilians getting killed all the time. We've had 200 civilian casualties this year in Rakhine alone. So this is has great implications for what we're trying to do. Aung San Suu Kyi, as you know, has um, all the 21st century Panlong Peace Conference. Uh, she held it for about four times. It's just, let's say, um, glorious window dressing, nothing of substance is being um, discussed there. If this is going to be more of the same for the next five years, you know, heaven help us. And um, we know that um, yesterday I was interviewed by BBC Bemis, you know, uh, the journalists had done the homework well, and we can't go any, we, we can't say anything definitely. The military held a press conference yesterday, but they say anything about it. But what we know is that General Mayonai, well, he may relinquish his post as commander in chief, but he will stay on in another post. We don't know exactly what it's going to be. You know? uh, it could be a um, military post or it could be a civilian post, uh, it could be a state post. We don't know exactly. I think we will probably know uh, early next year. So that's the situation as it stands. Now, for, if I may say, what does this imply? You know, what are the ramifications for foreign policy? Now, because of what has happened in the you know, uh, past term, especially what happened to the Rohingyas, Myanmar's relations with the West have cooled a lot. In fact, um, it was the West's support from the West that really helped uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, achieve the victory. But now there's been um, a rift, you know, and um, people on, well, the United States also had it, um, elections, and now Trump has conceded that he will step down and allow the um, transition to take place, and Biden is going to, well, um, get into the act. Now, there's a lot of speculation on what this would mean for Myanmar. You know, but it's too early to tell. Uh, it's much too early to say. To say. And um, we have to wait for that. You know? And um, with regard to China, I'm sure Ambassador Dr. will be uh, when, 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 
I'll bring it to the really? end now. Sorry for I'll, the I'll answer your questions when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's excellent. Uh, um, uh, Kenzo Wynn, you've not only uh, pre made your pre presentation very succinctly, but you also stuck to time. And um, in your presentation, I think you covered uh, this uh, very significant aspect of decision making and how it uh, reflects on every aspect of governance in Myanmar. And, 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 and this particular uh, forecast of yours or your estimate that the uh, current commander in chief uh, might uh, get another post either in government or in the military, we will see because I think he retires in April uh, April right. next year. Yes. And there is some speculation that he might look for the post of the vice president. But that apart, let's move on to another aspect of this webinar, which is on the India-Myanmar relations and where China figures in, in, in those relations. And we couldn't have got ourselves a better speaker Sense. than the former ambassador, uh, Gautam Mukhopadhyay. So Gautam, the floor is yours for the next 12 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, General Ashok Mehta. Thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you, IIC, as well. And, of course, my compliments to my brother, Ko Kin uh, for his excellent sort of uh, presentation on civil-military relationships and its impact on decision-making in Myanmar. Um, I've been asked to really focus on the China-Myanmar and India-Myanmar relations, but let me indulge myself a little and take a little liberty and try and actually start with giving a little bit of a balance sheet uh, between what the NLD and particularly Dong San Suu Kyi inherited in 2015-16 and what she the, and, the, and the inheritance that uh, the NLD has given after the recent elections. I'll just take a quick balance sheet on, on, on various points and of course I think I'll keep track of the time to, to be able to address the principal issues that I've been asked to address. So I think on civil military relations, Kim Zovin has said uh, almost everything. But I just want to make two observations. Well, I think we should appreciate that in 2015-16, you know, Dong San Suu Kyi was practically a poster girl of democracy worldwide. Uh, the military was very unhappy that it uh, could not sort of retain uh, uh, or hold power through the USDP. Nevertheless, over the last five years, a kind of uh, equilibrium, a cohabitation, between the civilian democracy and the military uh, uh, part of the government has survived. And not only survived, but they have managed to hold reasonably free and fair and you know timely elections uh, this year. So this is one. The second is very often people tend to think of this period as a transition to democracy, uh, you know, it, which started with uh, the uh, seven stage roadmap of Senior General Than Shui. But in fact, you know, in the last five years, we haven't seen any great deepening of democracy. In fact, on many large issues like the uh, powers of the states and uh, uh, you know, uh, even the appointment of the chief ministers, um, the NLD hasn't really pushed the envelope. So what we have actually seen is a transition from military power, you know, power based on uh, the coercive apparatus, to people's power. And mostly what Don San Suu Kyi has militated against is the limits and curbs on her power. I mean, the reforms to the constitution have been mostly on the curbs on her power uh, and uh, you know, uh, authority rather than uh, uh, any great deepening. I mean, of course, there has been an advance of democracy, but not a great deepening of democracy. Secondly, on the economy. On the economy, I would say that, uh, that uh, Burma inherited uh, a colonial economy. From there, General Navin introduced the Burmese way of socialism, which in effect made a rich country actually quite poor. And then you move to a kind of predatory military capitalism together with conflict capitalism, which was the some of the ethnic armed organizations and some of the uh, uh, you know business representatives of theirs. Uh, and then from there, move to a, a more broad-based uh, you know relationship between the Tamado and uh, select business people. Sometimes it's defined as crony capitalism, but that not would not be perfect. And over the last. Uh, 
uh, you know, since 2011, what we have seen with the economic reforms is a broadening of the, you know, ownership of the of the business class, and it has included the, the second generation. It has included expatriates. It has included new entrants. But it remains very much a kind of economy based on the property classes. We see a kind of frenzied real estate development. Uh, Dong San Suu Kyi has a populist streak. She could have used this to bring about much greater economic democracy. But in fact, we haven't seen much greater economic democracy. We've seen a continuing, a skewed economy in favor of the uh, property classes, which includes, of course, uh, the, the, the military as well. The third area is the peace process. You know, in the peace process inherited the nationwide ceasefire that was started by the USDP government. Eight ethnic parties signed on to the nationwide ceasefire uh, agreement. Seven, which who had agreed to the initial text, did not join because of other reasons that happened finally. But in the period, in spite of four Panglong conferences, and I think uh, uh, Kinzobin described that very well, uh, really there has been very little advance towards federalism, towards peace towards settlement of any of the major issues on which uh, the ethnics are aggrieved. And so today you have a situation where maybe two small parties have joined uh, to the nationwide ceasefire. But in fact, you have conflict raging in many other parts of the country. You have it in Kachin, particularly in Shan, the Shan State Army. Uh, you have the Kokan problem still live. The TNLA, which is the Palong, remains very active. And you have an entirely new conflict that has surfaced in uh, Rakhine in the Ayakan army. Uh, so, you know, the balance sheet is that she inherited a very good uh, uh, circumstance, but she has not been able to make much progress in that area. And the fourth issue is the Rohingya. Again, on the Rohingya, she inherited a messy situation. And this is, again, no fault of hers in this case. But in 2016, you had the first Arsa attacks. In 2017, you had a much more severe Arsa attacks. Then you had very uh, harsh and, you know, uh, strong uh, reprisals by the uh, by the uh, Myanmar army, uh, as uh, Kinzovin described, 700,000 more refugees in addition to those who were there already. Uh, you know, Myanmar has been taken to the International Court of Justice. And in fact, as a result of that, what we have seen in terms of Myanmar's international relations, a severe deterioration. You know, all the gains that were made by the USDP in terms of breakthroughs with the West have all but negated. The Islamic word is, uh, world is alienated. Uh, and, uh, you know, once again, Myanmar is thrown into the grip of China. And there, with the emergence of the Arakan army, where a Chinese hand is seen very strongly, this has also become a major irritant in Myanmar's relations with China. It's covert or suspected to be covert uh, uh, support for the, for the uh, Arakan army. So this brings us to uh, the, the, the issue of, of China. So I think, you know, if we see China's relations with Myanmar over the years, what we can see are distinctly three phases. In the first phase, as it tried to consolidate its revolution, you know, uh, uh, formalize its borders, and try and secure at least a reasonably. And this was done through the government. Uh, uh, you know, Zhou Enlai at that time made something like nine visits to uh, 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 Burma then by, the, uh, by 1960. Uh, and, you know, they signed a number of agreements, including a treaty of mutual non aggression in which they relinquished their claims. Uh, but later on, they started working with front organizations of the Burmese Communist Party. In 1962, after Nevin came, relations broke down. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Chinese who had been working through the ethnic Chinese and expatriates and the, and the front parties openly backed the Burmese Communist Party. Uh, and a conflict raged all through Shan State during that period. Shan State was virtually out of bounds. Between 1985 and 1988, uh, the you know the military government made amends with China, as a result of which, and this was partly precipitated by the you know student uh, agitations for democracy, and more or less this resulted in normalization of relations with the Myanmar army, um, and the, the the you know stopping of you know a, a, an individual peace agreements. Uh, signed with many of the ethnic uh, militias and the armed organizations during that period. Uh, and more or less from that period until about 2010-11, um, China conducted its relations mainly through the Tamado and uh, uh, you know, the SPDC first and then the USDP. Uh, in the second phase, which more or less began around the middle, uh, around the turn of the millennium, 
uh, the relationship was mainly economic. So that's that's when you had major investments like the Midzone Dam uh, for hydroelectricity, the Let Padong Tong copper mine. But in the third phase, which is what we are seeing starting from about 2010 or a little earlier, is a much more strategic economic uh, investment in Myanmar. It started off with the oil and gas pipelines leading to uh, from Chofu to Yudan. From there, it went to the special economic zone, which uh, the tender for which they won, uh, which was actually took place in the transition between the USDP government and the NLD government. The NLD government did not stop it. Uh, and then from there, they also got, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the prerogative of developing the Chosu deep sea port, which is one of the best natural harbors in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, from around the transition from uh, Dawn San Suu Kyi to, uh, to, from the USDP to the NLD, uh, China also launched its BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. And the backbone of the BRI in uh, Myanmar was provided by the China-Myanmar Economic Corridor, uh, which in effect is a combination of the oil, uh, the Chosu Special Economic Zone and the Deep Sea Port. But on top of that, a number of connectivity projects like a Chofu Mandalay Expressway, a Mandalay Muse, that's the China border uh, railway line, which had been actually the, an MOU had been signed earlier, but had lapsed, but that has been revived. And three border cooperation economic zones on the border, one at Muse Ruili, which is the main crossing point, but two others, Chin Sao, in the I think it's in the Kokang region, and also in Kampetki. Uh, and in the larger BRI framework, you also had this new Yangon project, which is a massive real estate project for, a, for new Yangon. So what China now visualized uh, in this was a kind of uh, a series of connectivity projects and infrastructure projects, uh, basically, uh, you know, undergrading the entire area between uh, Yunnan and the Bay of Bengal, which basically gave the ocean and also a kind of two Gautam, yes. Gautam, Gautam, you have to wind up. Yeah, you, uh, Gautam, please yeah. wind up. So now, so this has been the basic strategy, and they have pursued it politically. They've also pursued it through the ethnic armed organizations, and they've pursued it through other gray zone projects, plus you know plantations and many other things. Now, India's you know uh, uh, relationship during this period has been, I think, most of the conversation has been taken up by the connectivity projects. But India has had a very large number of uh, development projects that have been oriented at people. And if you see the strategies and the projects that have come up more recently, what we are seeing is that while there has been some delay in the connectivity projects, they are likely to come on stream in the next two, three years, uh, barring perhaps uh, you know some difficulties on the Kaladan project because of the Arakan army. Uh, but at least they are on stream and on course. But you have a number of other projects that are from industrial training centers to the Myanmar Institute of Information Technology to the Advanced Center for Agricultural Research and Extension and many new projects that are being discussed which are much more high value for example high voltage grid connectivity low voltage radial connectivity possibly very large downstream investments the investments in the petroleum sector these are under discussion so what we are seeing is a contrast between the Indian strategy uh, which is much more people oriented and the Chinese that this can be even deeper, uh, that it could be taken from, you know, the kind of training and other education projects, uh, capacity building projects, much more to the agri sector. But I think this we can discuss a little more in detail in the Q and A. Thank you, thank you, General Mehta. I think I've more or less kept to time. Yeah, you have, and you have covered uh, pretty comprehensively the charter given to you. Um, on on uh, India's focus on connectivity uh, in Myanmar. Uh, during the Q&A, we can come back to what uh, areas you may not have covered, like uh, India's Act East policy, and does Burma or Myanmar fit into the Indo-Pacific strategy? Uh, now, uh, it's my turn, and I will very briefly uh, cover on the defense and security relationship between these two countries, India and Myanmar. And I would have, uh, I would have liked to start 
by um, talking about the civil military relations which have been covered uh, very very adequately not just by the uh, by when but also by gautam mukhopadhyay but i think there is uh, one aspect that we should take note of in this relationship that india finally for the first time took note of this hybrid system and uh, signal to burma to myanmar that recognition and in october this year we had a delegation go visit myanmar and this was the first time in india's history that we had a joint civil military delegation which was led by the foreign secretary shringla and it had in it the army chief general mm M. narwane now this was a tacit recognition of this power sharing system within myanmar itself where it is interesting to note that three of the ministries in government are reserved for the tamada and which which are the ministries of uh, internal affairs uh, the minister uh, the ministry for defense and the ministry for border affairs and they have in myanmar at the apex a national defense and security council to which the three services and the police report so that's the apex uh, security uh, body uh, on the question of uh, the reservation of seats that 25% of seats being reserved for the military uh, in the central parliament in the regional assemblies as well as the state assemblies and if you do an arithmetic of this any reform of the constitution which requires a two third majority it becomes extremely difficult if not impossible because of this reservation of seats now um it it was mentioned also that uh, the on south suchi had defended the military at the international court of justice on the crackdown which was ordered by the cnc in the rakhine province uh, that led to a lot of international opprobrium that she attracted but and her international image was severely tarnished but that won her a lot of popularity domestically but overall as our two speakers have said that um, the nld in its performance has not made uh, any great gains now the other aspect that uh, one can talk about is the on the military and the defense and security side is the insurgency in the rakhine province and uh, ambassador mukhopadhyay uh, mentioned about the arsa the arsa is the arakan rohingya salvation army which came up after the crackdown on the rohingyas and there are some reports um, that i have read in myanmari newspapers that um, there is an element of uh, islamic state which is trying to penetrate this province uh, the other report that is emanating is about the assistance that is being uh, provided to the arakan army by the chinese in terms of uh, weapons the myanmari army has talked about this without naming china but saying a powerful country has been doing this and as ambassador mukhopadhyay mentioned in the uh, rakhine state uh, where the arakan army is operating we have this uh, 
मल्टी मॉडल कलादान प्रोजेक्ट टू लिंक फ्रॉम सिटवे एप पोर्ट टू मिजोरम एंड देन ब्रांच इनटू म्यांमार बिकॉज ऑफ द इंसर्जेंसीज both in the uh, both by the arakan army in the chin and the rakhin state and the insurgencies up in the north in india the road construction was which was meant to be north south has now shifted or rather which was meant to be south north has shifted to being north south because of the depredations of the arakan army now as far as uh, and the, the the last part i would like to cover what uh, the uh, the indian ministry of defense is doing for the myanmar army we are providing them all kinds of uh, small arms uh, tanks guns uh, we have given them uh, a submarine a kilo class submarine recently plus offshore patrol vessels uh, their training a lot of their training is done in indian uh, military institutes uh, there are staff level talks army to army navy to navy uh, joint training uh, coordinated patrolling both at on land and at sea and in 2015 a very important uh, exercise or a military operation was carried out where elements of the kamtapur liberation organization ulfa bodos and nsnk uh, they were flushed out through this joint operation in about june operation sunrise 2 in june 2015 very recently a pact has been signed i think during this uh, joint delegation visit last month that uh, neither country will allow the use of its territory for for any actions which are inimical to the other and along with that um, and uh, slightly earlier about 20 i think it was about 22 insurgents were handed over by the memories to the indian government a lot lot of other uh, action activities are taking place uh, showing that uh, between the two countries defense ties have certainly moved on when from the first visit of general bipin joshi in 1998 and i'll stop here and i will move to dr avinash paliwal and i will uh, request him to make his inter- intervention dr paliwal Thank you so much, uh, General mm-hmm. Mehta, and also thank you to Ambassador Mukhopadhyay and Dr. Kinzovin for some really kind of you know comprehensive coverage of issues that are important for Myanmar and the region, uh, and also for General Mehta to kind of unpack the the defence relationship. I really have an embarrassment of riches in terms of the questions uh, that I perhaps can ask as a discussant. At this stage, I'll you know I'll I'll re. I'll keep my questions to two aspects, uh, and it'll it's it's for the whole panel really, or you know, anyone can take take a stab at these questions. First of all, I was quite struck recently after the elections took place, and after you know, as Dr. Kinzowen explained, it, there's a bit of uh, a contest in terms of you know uh, the 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 validity of the results, but that's unlikely to go very far. The NLD has won. but then at least in rakhine i saw something very unusual happening and this was that the arakan army is actively collabor uh, not not collaborating but is actively communicating to tamado and uh, requesting the government of myanmar requesting the election commission to hold elections in townships where the elections could not be held and there are quite a few areas in in especially in in uh, in regions where there is active conflict going on where elections could not be held so we are looking at pockets of demography in myanmar who did not have a say in this electoral exercise so what how do you explain this coming to terms between two sides which are very actively very brutally fighting each other past, for the past few years in recent times that the tamado and arakan army who agree at least in principle if not in practice to hold elections in this these parts of rakhine 
why is that happening is am i am i wrong in assessing that this is some sort of a a kind of strange alliance happening between you know unlikely bedfellows uh, against the nld because both the military and the arakan army at least in rakhine context view nld as as a force which they would not like to see rise beyond a point the second question that i have again there has been a lot of very valuable points that have been raised about the future leadership right especially in the civil military context uh, it was mentioned that after april 2021 when his tenure is coming to an end general min nong lang is likely to continue in power in some which way or the other i want to ask a question to the panel how do they see the future of nld as a party over the period of time especially if you look at the evolution of of the national league of democracy from the 19 late 1980s till today there has been quite considerable centralization of power in the hands of aung san suu kyi and i am struggling to see who the future leaders of this political party will be what implications does this have uh, on on the on the general of course uh, democratic health of myanmar but also what options this perhaps you know lack of leadership uh, forthcoming leadership within one of the most important political parties in myanmar has on the relationship that perhaps china and india can have with this country i'll stop there thank you so much thank you very much uh, dr palewal for those uh, uh, your comments and questions for the panel i would urge the audience those listening into this webinar please post your questions in the chat box and uh, we'll uh, take those questions in the meanwhile um, why not uh, get uh, kim ro win to take on this first question raised by dr palewal on election in rakhin would you do that yes yes yeah thank you thank you is a very good question that we are all thinking about in memoir moments you can hear yeah, me now that's okay. okay okay yeah yeah you can hear me okay yeah there, there was a um, press conference from the military some time ago that um they had even helped with air force helicopters to bring all the necessary ballot boxes and paraphernalia to the townships in uh, Rakhine northern Rakhine where they were cancels well the army um spokesman was not very clear about it but it it meant that they were not they were not set against elections in Rakhine but they made one very telling statement and said that they were only giving remarks the united the union elections commission made the decision now Rakhine is uh, well medium sized state is coastal it has 17 townships and nine out of them elections were cancelled and that was the stronghold of the uh, major rakhine party and um, i think um, it's let's say that the arakan army well it's been blamed and it's been labeled as a terrorist organization but it has spoken out for democracy you know that's people who have been disenfranchised should be given a chance to vote and immediately the the army agreed with them and they are having some discussions so this could be well the spark that can bring everything to, everything together it can even lead to a cessation of hostilities and the um peace negotiations between both sides but the nld has not um officially replied on this you know and this is the question that is hanging in the air i would say that it would be extremely risky for the nld government if it were to decline the offers for elections to be held well the arakan army wants it to be held before the end of the year we don't know exactly uh, my feeling is that the elections have to be held um uh, gotham why why don't you take on this Uh, General Mehta, I seem to have lost you. Yeah. Uh, the question, 
Okay. What about? Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Yes. Uh, the question raised is on the future of the NLD leadership. How is this leadership going to develop, and what are the problems of uh, the future leadership, both in terms of uh, their internal development as well as in terms of their relationship with the military? Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Avinash, for both those questions. Uh, in in many ways, I think uh, Kinzovian is much more competent to answer the second question as well. But let me take a bash at it. I think it's really a matter of concern uh, that the NLD has not been able to groom a second generation of leaders. And not only that, even leaders who had the potential of being alternatives outside the NLD, people like Kokoji and uh, you know the various other national parties that did try uh, to make a bid during this election have all failed miserably. And clearly, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's personal appeal uh, is really carrying the day. And that personal appeal cannot easily be transferred unless she anoints a successor of her own choice, which she shows no signs of doing, uh, or it is earned by someone. And that earning can only happen through kind of democratic uh, activity. One thing is very clear that uh, the Burmese people have now for the second time and actually even earlier, if you think of 1990, have very clearly pronounced against rule by the military. I think that is something that we need to take into account. Dong San Suu Kyi had the opportunity after, before 2015 and after 2015 of actually you know, using that people power that I talked about and going to the streets uh, in order to push this uh, agenda further. But she has perhaps wisely uh, refrained uh, from it. Technically, uh, it's possible, you know, under the constitution, the military could still use any of the insurgencies that are on or some deterioration in the insurgencies to declare an emergency and come back. This is one possibility. The second possibility is that Dong San Suu Kyi takes the populist route and, you know, appeals to the masses. But I don't see that happening. And I don't see an individual uh, in the horizon who could pick up the mantle that, uh, you know, that she has inherited and carried so far. So I'm afraid I cannot point you in a direct, uh, in, a, in, in a particular direction. Uh, and on the other question, you know, it's a very interesting question. And I, I, I have a feeling uh, I would be right in saying that what it shows is the rivalry between, between the Tamado and the civilian democracy led by NLD and perhaps the personalities of Senior General Minong Lang and Aung San Suu Kyi is such that they are willing to spite uh, in a way, the country to be able to spite the other. And this has happened before. This had happened before in the context of uh, the handover of the Chinese <laughs> Z to, to China during the transition period. And I suspect that once again, uh, the military is playing politics uh, with the Arakan army on this in order to embarrass the, uh, the NLD government. But the NLD government also needs to react uh, you know, nimbly uh, to this challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Gautam. Um, the, uh, there is a question from the audience. Uh, in fact, there are a couple of questions. And there is one from uh, Mr. Upendra Bagel. It's for uh, Ken Zawin. And the question relates to, is the Myanmar government prepared for the fallout of a, any of the military and government officials who are indicted by the International Criminal Court on the Rohingya issue? It's um, interviewed on uh, very regularly. Just the other day, uh, I had two interviews with the, with the lo local media about ICJ. It attracts a lot of attention, you know. Um, some of the comments are, are critical of what I, what I say. But I say, what, what I'm really basically saying is that please bring this out into the open a bit, you know. The reports to the um, ICJ are not made public. Well, the government is um, acceding to the requests from there and it's um, uh, submitting those reports, but the public don't know anything of it. On the long run, 
I feel that it'll be a long drawn out court case. You know? And um, well, the bottom line is that the, both the military and the civilian um, leadership know that they can't be, um, well, they can be indicted, but no direct action can be taken against them. You know? Because um, whatever happens, you know, if they don't travel to Europe or to other countries, well, nobody's going to come into Myanmar to arrest them. Well, that's the bottom line. So I think they will try to ev evade the proceedings as much as possible. I think they should get good advice from uh, legal experts. They've um, engaged a team of international lawyers, but it's only their defense. They did very poorly against the people from Gambia. And um, well, this is out of, the, out of the blue. If relations with the United States can be brought back to normal. Perhaps they can get some advice and some helpful um, um, assistance from the U.S. administration. But this is going to be a very messy affair. I've, I've told them that they should have collaborated with the International Fact-Finding Mission and they should collaborate with the UN Special Rapporteurs. Aung San Suu Kyi turned both of them down. You know? So what I can say, like I said, it, it's going to be very messy and it's going to be long drawn out. But whether they can actually evade the actions from the court, it's um, difficult to say. I tell even in my, I'm the only one who speaks out this way, that it could be bad for Myanmar. Even, even now, the prestige has been crumbling. It could be bad for Myanmar if they can't handle it well. That's all that they say at the moment. Uh, Kim Zawin, there is another question for you from uh, Dr. Rudhay Bhanmu Singh. He's from the IDSA. I know. And he, I know. Yeah, he, he's done a lot of work on Myanmar. And his question is that has Myanmar distanced itself further from ethnic reconciliation? I think Gautam uh, briefly referred to that and he also said that you might be able to throw some more light. So that's that's one question for you. And the question for uh, after you is for Ambassador Upadhyaya does, and again from Uday Banu saying, is does India need to recalibrate its relationship with Myanmar overall? Uh, Kinzo, when first you. Thank you, Kinzo. And uh, Uday, uh... Good question. Um, succinctly, I would say Myanmar is not um, distancing itself from ethnic reconciliation, but it's going to be more subtle than that. Now, the NLD after the elections has called uh, 48 um, ethnic parties to join in the efforts and some sort of collaboration. And some have accepted they will meet very soon. But uh, Aung San Suu Kyi herself has been dropping hints that um, the reconciliation that she has in mind is that for the NLD to remain the umbrella organization for all the other parties and the small ethnic parties could join with it. Of course, most of the ethnic politicians don't like that at all. But the, the voters seem to have um, thought differently. Look at the results that um, the NLD, the votes that NLD, the seats that it gained in the states, you know, Karen, almost in Kachin State, Real State, and Karen State, one state, it gains a lot of seats. So, do the ethnic public, of course, we can, we can say that the uh, populations are in many ways mixed now, um, will really reconcile themselves to being. Um, closely, you know, um, tied to, to the NLD and even subordinating themselves. You know? Now, we are, on this matter, we are at a crucial juncture. Now, federalism is still some distance away, but it seems to be signaling that um, there's a feeling that both the military and the NLD governments are not too favorably inclined towards federalism. And the ethics don't like that. You know? So can can both sides come to 
some sort of um, compromise. Uh, um, use another word like decentralization and really um, forge or fashion an arrangement where there is some self-determination, but all under the aegis of the NLD. Reconciliation, yeah. well, well, it'll happen, but in a way that the NLD seems to be able to direct now. Right, thank you. Uh, Gautam? Yes. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Udai Bhanu Singh. Uh, so I won't say recalibrate the relationship, but what I think India needs to be wary of is that the uh, relationship between the military and the NLD uh, breaks down to such a point that once again we are thrown back to a kind of 1988 situation where we have to take sides for one or the other. And I think the answer to that is uh, something that I will also link with uh, uh, General Ashok Mehta's you know, uh, poser in the beginning that I could also address the, uh, ish, the, the Act East and Indo-Pacific. I think the way to go about this is that, you know, we have been, we started off with connectivity projects and I think we are more or less moving more and more on to very people-oriented problem uh, uh, projects, uh, mainly in the area of capacity building, a whole series of them, border area development projects, uh, you know, the Rakhine State Development Project and the various other projects that I mentioned. Uh, I think the, this is good, but what we need to do is really scale it up for public impact, uh, for, you know, the kind of political impact that we want. But also we need to move deeper and the way to move deeper is actually to invest. You know, Myanmar is a country like much of India where 70% of the economy lives off agriculture and allied services, uh, fisheries, uh, forest products, uh, animal husbandry, horticulture, and so on. So I would think that, you know, what we should do is back a private sector investment strategy in the agri-rural processing sector, not only all over Myanmar, but all the way down the CLMV up to Vietnam. Uh, and that means the, the route for your Act East policy now has to move beyond capacity building to agri and rural processing, where you're going to really touch the grassroots of the economy. And this will be a decidedly, you know, the, the best way of uh, the highest form of people to people relations are uh, where you provide employment, value adding, uh, entrepreneurship and business to business ties at that level. So I would suggest a strategy of, you know, small and medium enterprises that focus on processing uh, the agri-rural products, whether it is rice or oil seeds or beans and pulses on which we depend a lot. And this should be the strategy all the way sub-region, uh, down CNLNV, up to Vietnam and up to the the the, the South China Sea and effectively the Indo-Pacific. And, you know, in our Indo-Pacific strategy, we tend to rely a lot on palm mill strategies. But we forget the rise of China was firstly an economic rise. And we need to have a response to China that is also economic and not just Paul Mill. And we cannot uh, reply to China in the ways that China uh, excels. We need to go deeper and, you know, below the Chinese radar effectively. China is not interested in small and medium enterprise uh, type of uh, uh, investments. So if we think of a, two things, a chain link of uh, investments in this region all the way to the, uh, to the South China Sea on the one hand and a digital belt you know, where we uh, IT applications, whether they are in governance or they are in health or they are in education or any number of series where IT has a great potential, software uh, potential. If this, if we can capitalize on these two, in addition to what we are doing, you know, I'm not saying avoid uh, big investments, avoid power, avoid energy, avoid industry, uh, uh, you know, light, light industry is another very important area. Textiles is a very important area. So we should move much deeper economically. And elsewhere, I've even suggested that we should think of a, a bilateral uh, comprehensive economic agreement uh, with Myanmar that can be expanded to the CLMV and to the BIMSTEC. Uh, and that would be our way of, in a way, uh, you know, responding to our failure to sign up to the RCEP. Thank you, uh, Gautam. We have time for one more question, and I'll use my prerogative as a moderator to ask Avinash. Uh, this question, uh, if you put on your, uh, if you look at the crystal ball, how do you see uh, in Myanmar any reforms to the constitution which will permit uh, a deepening of democracy and, civil and military under civilian control?
Thank you so much for, for that question, General Mehta. It's given the situation as of today and given the trends as of to, today, which very eloquently were kind of articulated by Ambassador Mukhopadhyay and Dr. Kinzo Wynn, it's, it's difficult for me to foresee a moment of complete overhaul uh, in the civil-military relationship in the favor of the civilian, civilian government. There are two aspects to this, right? One, that there is, you're dealing with a military which is not just a political actor, but is an, is an increasingly insecure political actor. You can see this in the kind of reactions, whether it's, it's in the elections in Rakhine, collaborating with uh, Arakan army to embarrass the NLD, whether it is challenging the legis legitimacy of the results, um, which you know we are unfortunately also seeing in the United States today. But you can see that the military slightly unsettled at the moment. And when an institution of that sort, who, which has been in power for a long time, feels insecure, uh, it often pushes back and pushes back pretty hard. So whether it's with uh, with Minong Lang in at, at helm of affairs in his current garb or in any different particular position in the future, I do not see the military giving up on those 25% of, of reservations of seats within the parliament anytime soon. That will be a very hard fight. And I think that will be a harder fight for the NLD in particular, simply because of its internal shortcomings, which Ambassador Mukhopadhyay kind of highlighted quite well about the lack of leadership building. Deepening of democracy is not just about, as you all know, holding elections every five years. It's also about giving, creating opportunity for different political voices from different uh, demographies, but also from different age brackets. Myanmar is it's a young country in many ways, right? And not ha not foreseeing the rise of alternative uh, political leaderships, despite the people very clearly wanting a civilian-run government, that is what concerns me, and that I think would be a strategic handicap in a political sense for the civilian leadership, both of the NLD, but also for other political parties. So if I have to do that kind of crystal gazing, it, right now, the situation looks grim. The last point I'll say there on that aspect is also the fact that uh, there is, with the rise of Buddhist nationalism, the way we have seen, we have also seen the rise of illiberal tendencies in Myanmar, whether it's on the issue of Rohingyas, whether it's on the issue of the peace processes, there is a very clear consolidation or along ethnic lingual lines in the in the Bamar uh, regions of the country where and the alienation among the minority uh, communities has only increased as is witnessed by by uh, the raging conflicts uh, you know in in, in, in and across uh, north and west and east Myanmar unless those issues are unless this rise of illiberalism this rise of nationalism is you know the repercussions of it, it is discussed very honestly within within the civil and military kind of uh, landscape it will be very difficult for anyone to move out of the kind of uh, trend of this very stiff balance between the two political leaderships of the military and the nld uh, to get out of that shell i think that will be very difficult so whether it happens from an external push whether it happens due to internal factors needs to be seen but the trend as of now is uh, a continuity in this sort of very centralized power, uh, power uh, kind of you know centralization of power in both uh, the civilian sector and the military sector. Uh, thank you, Avinash, on that uh, somewhat uh, bleak uh, but realistic note. Um, we have to end this program. Uh, with that, we will be ending for this year our neighborhood first series. And we will take it on uh, beginning next year. So all that is left for me to do right now is to thank uh, the three speakers, or in fact, including myself, the four speakers, uh, for a, a very competent present for very competent presentation. And on behalf of IIC. I would like to thank the audience also and our speakers. Until next time, goodbye and see you again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye, Avinash. Bye, Kinzogin. Yeah. Bye, Jenna. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, Jenna. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Bye.